Hi everyone and welcome to, I'm going to count this as season three of the Living for Food podcast. I wanted to come out with this podcast back in September, which I even lie and say on this episode that that's what's going to happen. But fortunately and unfortunately, I had so, so much work and still kind of do that I wasn't able to get it out when I initially wanted But we are here now, and I have exciting guests for you coming up. I first have Catherine Perez. You might know her on Instagram as at plantbasedrd. She has over 1 million followers. She's a vegan registered dietitian, and she focuses on plant-based recipes to nourish your whole self. So we started talking about everything from her new cookbook, which I added to my Amazon storefront, and you can go grab there. And then we get into her family life and and all things cooking. So I think you'll really enjoy this episode. I am going to release an episode every two weeks. So every other week versus the weekly episodes that I was doing previously, just to make sure I'm keeping up with everything and make everything a little bit more consistent. If there's anyone you'd like to see on the podcast, always feel free to reach out and email me. And yes, this should be a super exciting season. I'm always grateful for everyone that's able to come on and grateful for everyone's listening. If you stuck out with me through that hiatus and are back to listen again, I appreciate you so, so very much. So please join me in welcoming the wonderful Catherine Perez. Welcome to the Living for Food pod. This is actually, I haven't recorded since the beginning of June. So oh, wow. this, is, this is my hiatus coming back from it and everything. So I'm, I'm like super excited. I haven't done this in so long. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. These are always so fun to do because it at least gives me an opportunity to kind of speak to someone else outside of my phone when I'm recording videos. <laughs> No, that's so true. Every time I make a TikTok, it's just me looking at myself all day. Yeah. (laughs) So funny. All right. So, I mean, I received a copy of your cookbook, which I'm super excited about. But before we get into that, I would love to get into your food background, talk a little bit more about you and stuff. So I, I dive a little deep if that works for you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Love it. I was reading through your forward where you said the kitchen was more of a chaotic place for you um, growing up. What was one of your earliest memories where you thought, you know, cooking isn't really for me? Oh, my. There's quite a bit. But one (laughs) that kind of like sticks out quite vividly in my memory is one time when I was trying to cook a lunch for myself, like I had gotten some like burgers or something like that out of the freezer. Mm -hmm. And I thought it's very simple. I just put it in a pan. Everything will be fine. I just have to reheat it. Like I don't even have to shape the burger or anything. (laughs) What could go wrong? (laughs) Yeah. And I still managed to like scorch the pan. Like I ruined the pan. I set off the fire alarm. And after that, I was, I pretty much told my mom, I was like, I think I'm just not meant to cook. And um, I kind of like jokingly since that point kind of told her, yeah, you know, I, you know, if I find someone, you know, they're going to have to be the one that cooks, like I will be the business person, (laughs) you know, and she was just like, I don't think that that's going to work out. And I was like, no, no, like, I'll, I'll figure it out. And yeah, it's kind of, funny that it didn't necessarily work out the way I thought. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it kind of worked out in my favor, honestly. And I'm glad I did end up going back to the kitchen because, Mm -hmm. you know, outside of just like, you know, being able to create a business out of it, I feel like it's such an important skill that people shouldn't be sleeping on. Um, It's so important to be able to kind of like take care of yourself. And cooking is definitely one of those skills that you need to do that. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I feel like I used to be one of those people, especially before getting into food journalism and talking to everyone that used to think, oh, it's so easy. How can people just not follow a recipe? Mm -hmm. It literally tells you flat out. And I'm like, no, it it is a skill because even if you read a recipe, you kind of have to judge what you're doing, how much, like when to take something off. Like it's still something 
that has like a learning curve yep. kind of deal. And I, I think the people that are like, oh, it's just a recipe. I don't know how people are bad at cooking. You really have to think about it. And it's a form of a form of science for a lot of people. And especially the kitchen itself can be so daunting just to like cook vegetables. When I grew up, my family was and my parents would always cook me vegetables and stuff. So I would take it for granted. And then when I went to cook for myself, I was like, what the heck do I do? You know, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. how do I cook broccoli? I don't really remember, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's definitely a learning curve for sure. Oh, absolutely. I feel like the other thing about it too, is that even like if you're cooking a recipe uh, and following it to a T, oftentimes mm -hmm. it'll even take you like much longer than what the recipe will tell you it will take, yes, you know, um, so true. and a lot of it isn't even necessarily that the person that evaluated the time is incorrect. It's more of like, you know, that person knows what they're anticipating when they're cooking the recipe. And mm -hmm. there's kind of like almost that sense of doubt when you're trying something for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times it just takes that practice of being able to do something enough time. So that way it makes sense to you. And then you're, you're not really overthinking it while you're in the kitchen. Cause I think that's what ends up adding a lot of time or frustration when it comes to cooking. Mm -hmm. It's just like that level of uncertainty when you haven't necessarily acquired a certain skill quite yet. Right. Right. And I think too, it just, what comes with the overthinking is trying to make it perfect, being a perfectionist. And I got rid of that real quick. I was like, I want it to look good. I want it to be like aesthetically pleasing. And I'm like, I've learned that things can taste so good and not look like a chef did it, you know? So I can't say my cutting skills are the best. My knife skills <laughs> are probably could be improved, but I stopped caring about how I chopped onions or whatever, and everything will end up tasting the same, you know? I think too, I had switched to a gas stove mm -hmm. when I had um, moved to California and you have to take into account what your kitchen looks like, what your kitchen setup is too. Yeah. So there's just like so much that goes into it and it's so nuanced. But anyways, that's a long winded way of saying if you're a beginning cook or whatever, listen to other people's tips and you'll end up figuring it out and try not to get too stressed along the way because it can be very stressful. Yeah. If you let it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> If you let yourself burn burgers, then it can be very stressful. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think a lot of it is being able to kind of like adapt as you go and right. not everything's going to be perfect. And, you know, even if you follow something to a T, you might end up changing something after that one time that you make it to mm -hmm. make it your own. And I think that's kind of like the really cool aspect about cooking and why I feel like there's so many cookbooks that exist to begin with, right. because like, while you might see like, oh my gosh, the 10th, you know, baked oatmeal, a mm -hmm. lot of times there's kind of like that little variation or that little change that kind of like makes it specifically special to, you know, that mm -hmm. one person that's creating it, but it can also taste completely different than the ninth, you know, oatmeal recipe that you tried before you tried that 10th one. So you know, there's a lot of perspectives, everyone's tastes are different. And I think it's really important for people to kind of realize that aspect of cooking that you kind of have to, you know, use things as a guideline, but craft it in a way that makes it special to you. Right, right. And I'm curious, too, because, you know, I read that you had a Dominican mother growing up who prioritized cooking and cleaning and a lot of the more traditional way of doing things. But were you observing her be behavior and wanting to do the opposite because you weren't as great of a cook at back then? Or were you learning? Like, what was the um, mindset for you? Yeah, at the time, I feel like I was very blessed that my mom, like, took care of so many different things in the household that allowed me to focus on schooling. Because, like, originally, before yeah. I even looked at becoming a creator, my focus was to become a doctor and originally I was thinking like, oh yeah, that's going to be my path. And because of that, mm -hmm. you know, you have to study so, so much. So there's really yes. not a lot of time to kind of like think about doing any other thing. So, you know, I was very mm -hmm. blessed in the sense that like my mom 
was handling a lot of that stuff while I was doing like school and all the extracurriculars. Like I would just come home and she would have like a big pot of, you know, moro waiting for me to like eat. Mm -hmm. And that was like very exciting for me because I was like, oh, I didn't even have to like lift a finger. Like it's already done and ready for me to eat. For me, as I continued growing, I would pay attention to what my mom was doing in the kitchen, but I wasn't necessarily looking at it from the perspective of like, oh yeah, I'm going to become a cook too. It was more so I was just like interested in like how she learned how to do this, like why her rice was different than like all my Tia's rices. Like they like everyone had something different. And I was always confused because I was like, oh, but didn't you guys grow up in the same household? Like why is everyone's right, meal right. taste different? So that part mm-hmm. was the thing that always intrigued me. But I never imagined kind of like going beyond that. Yeah, no, I totally get it. I feel like too, I mean, every kid probably does this. Um, if you have parents that cook regularly, I took it for granted so much. Just coming home from school, snacks, like whatever it was, even if it was just like a simple meal of mac and cheese, broccoli and meatloaf or something right. like that was ready for me. And now as an adult, I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish food would just appear sometimes. Like, I don't want (laughs) to. Yeah. Like if I didn't have to worry about like struggling to find something to eat for lunch, I feel like (laughs) life would be so much better. (laughs) No, literally it's like breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then it's repeat, repeat, repeat. I'm like, will I ever get a break? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Sometimes you want that break. And I, I feel like that's kind of like one of those valid reasons why you see a lot of people go for like convenience foods or like eating out a mm-hmm. lot instead of trying to do like a home cooked meal because it's like that extra pressure of like, oh my gosh, it's an extra thing to do. Right. And, you know, a lot of recipes can seem very overwhelming and complicated if you don't, you're not in the right mindset. Right. Right. And this, re- this relates to, um, kind of going out and eating out as well, but, or choosing convenience foods because sugar was a big staple in your lifestyle early on, which I would say was for me too. I would literally eat ice cream every single day after school. Yeah. When, you know, that person you cared about came home and you mentioned that they were diagnosed with prediabetes and high cholesterol, what was running through your head? Was this like an immediate, okay, I need to make a change or was this a slow burn kind of situation? Well, originally when we got the diagnosis, my first thought process was more so like, how do I help this person get better? Mm -hmm. Because essentially when they came home from the doctor, they were pretty much told like, oh, just avoid all these foods, which, you know, it can help in a sense, but it's also like, not explaining like what to do afterwards like you take out all this food but like okay well what do you eat in place of the things that you were eating Mm -hmm. consistently before and you know I felt like I had to find an answer I had to give them some type of information because they were very distressed about this and Mm -hmm. I wanted them to feel comfortable because I feel like food is comfort and when you're taking away that significant amount of comfort yeah it leads to a lot of stress and, you know, a lot of complications and it can flip someone's life upside down. So I wanted to kind of give them that relief and peace of mind in general, because I feel like this happens to quite a number of people. And this is just even from within my own practice. It's like, you see all these people that just don't know what to do. And so I was very determined to figure that out for them. I did a lot of research, found out the foods that they should be focusing on. And then as I was doing a lot of that research, especially because like I, like I mentioned, I was looking to become a doctor. I was like very interested in research. So I ended up looking at different research articles and finding a lot of things regarding like plant-based eating. That was very interesting to me at the time. We started implementing a lot more plant-based foods, you know, into our diets in general. Um, My mom was very big also on like making sure that we had vegetables at the table, like at every meal. (laughs) It all kind of made more sense when I was looking at it from the plant-based angle. And I decided kind of on my own that I wanted to kind of do this like 100%. Like I wanted to do 100% plant-based. And then I found like other reasons that kind of compelled me further to kind of stick to it for the long term. And I I think you're totally right because... Food is such a comfort that when you're given a list, uh, this has happened to people I've cared about as well, is that they're given a list of do's and don'ts. And it can be so overwhelming, but also just upsetting 
for people who really enjoy food and want to turn to it, whether it's because, you know, of their heritage where it's a piece of comfort for their family or just like maybe emotionally um, in a healthy way, of course, but it can just be really, really distressing for people. And then that's when they just decide not to do it. Because when I'm overwhelmed with something, I'll just not do it, honestly. Like, I'll just be like, okay, this is too much for me. And then it'll sit there, whatever the task or whatever it is. And that could be the same with your diet. And then they don't make those changes. Because a lot of the times doctors don't really lead the path. They just say, here's your do's and don'ts. Yeah. Hope you, you know, figure it out kind of right and you know they might give you some time to try and figure it out but they you know if they're not giving you plenty of information a lot of times you end up just getting like medication you're like all right well good luck and it's Uh yeah it's like okay well it's not very helpful it's not very encouraging and you know Mm -hmm. at least like from my own experience with working with others you know oftentimes it really kind of defeats you and it makes you not want to even try Mm -hmm. at all but like sometimes if you have the information you're more willing to at least try and make some changes which i think is it's always better to do something than nothing you know and i feel like we have to give people the opportunity to make that decision for themselves Right, right. And you, a lot of the times you don't have to flip your life all no. upside down and change everything. It could just be subtle things. Like when I figured out that I feel better being gluten free, that's just the way I figured out. I'm, I've also figured out I'm intolerant to apples, which is unfortunate. My husband too. <laughs> oh, you are? Yeah. Well, my it's husband. A- yeah, yeah. He's... <laughs> so, you know, I just removed that on my diet and instead you know, switch it to bananas. And I actually love bananas. So it's like subtle things like that, where you don't need to give up everything in your life, because I'll still enjoy cookies, but maybe instead, I'll find really amazing gluten free recipes that there are so many out there. At this point that I've made gluten free cookies, and people didn't even know they were gluten free. You know, I feel like too, though, when you are given restrictions like that, or at least there's something you want to change, you can kind of fall a little bit into this hole of calorie counting and following fad diets, which I feel like everyone has experienced at this point, probably at one point or another, was your interest in nutrition and science, did it help you steer away from that? Or is that something you kind of fell into as well? So when we're doing a lot of the education work and even just like the internship that follows, you know, your graduate, uh, after your graduation, mm-hmm a lot of that is focused on calories. Like that's kind of like a base of like what we learn. However, when I've worked from like the side of prevention and um, wellness, I felt that I didn't necessarily need that detailed information as much only because Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of times we hyper-focus on that and we end up missing out on a lot of a lot of other nutrients. And it's kind of, I see this a lot, especially with any kind of like fad that you see on the internet. Like, you know, I know Mm -hmm. a lot of people hyper-focus on protein and not saying that protein's not important. No, that's so But like some people (laughs) will take that information to the extreme, right? So like they might Mm -hmm. have just like a giant piece of chicken and maybe like this really small side salad and they'll be like, all right, I'm done. I, you know, I got my high protein meal in, but you know, they miss out on like all the other nutrients that they could be getting from other foods that might be, you know, better in balance on the plate versus just hyper Mm -hmm. fixating on like one macronutrient because like overall, you know, when it comes to health, it's like the big picture is the thing that matters most. It's, what are you right. eating most of the time? Like, are you getting enough fiber? Are you getting enough iron or, you know, zinc or magnesium from like the foods that you're eating? And, mm-hmm. you know, when you take away a big portion from your plate, or if you're minimizing your calories, like so small, those are all potentially mm-hmm. like missed opportunities to nourish yourself. And, you know, oftentimes when I was, you know, looking at calories, like in school or, you know, in the hospital, if I was doing a calorie count on a patient, a lot of that was more so for um, trying to one, help them, for example, either make healthy weight, because a lot of people might stop eating when they're in the hospital. Like, a lot of it wasn't always necessarily focused on like, 
weight loss, which I know is typically why mm-hmm. people tend to like hyper focus on the calorie aspect. But there is a right. way to kind of like do a lot of the things that you want to do from like a healthy perspective without having to hyper fixate on just like calorie counting. Yeah, that's so true. The The protein point is really interesting because I do see that everywhere. And then I, I find it creeping into my own brain. Even the other day, I had a salad and I just didn't have protein on hand. I was traveling, so I, I didn't have time to cook anything. And I had an incredible salad with like all the, these vegetables and like really good stuff. And then I was like, oh, but it's not a full meal because I don't have chicken yeah. or something. And that just, I mean... Obviously, you need to get your protein in at different times, but like I had already had protein that morning and I knew I was going to have it that night. So I was like, I wonder why I'm so hyper fixated on that. But I think it's just how much social media and not just social media, but just like people tell you that protein is like so, so important. And even like the protein powders and stuff, like all of that kind of whole world just makes you hyper fixate on it so much. I also stopped using my Apple watch recently because I loved it at first because it would count my runs and it would count my exercising. But then I found myself so obsessed with looking at it while I was exercising that I wasn't even enjoying the exercise or I would look at it at the end of the day and be upset that I didn't meet my 600 calorie burn goal or something like that. It's just so interesting how we've relied on technology like that. And it's kind of can mess with your head. Oh, absolutely. I feel like while a lot of these tools can give you some good information and depending on, you know, how you're approaching Mm -hmm. it, utilizing that information, I feel like when we are kind of bombarded with too much information, it overloads our brains Mm -hmm. and, You know, it's kind of like what I just mentioned with calorie counting. Like a lot of times you hyper fixate on this one specific number goal. And if you're under or over Mm -hmm. a certain day, it almost feels like it completely ruins someone's day. And it's not necessarily the case. You know, it's not like at 12 o'clock midnight, your whole body resets and it forgets everything that you consumed the day before or you know, it's, it's in my mind, it right? <laughs> like if it, it almost feels that way, but you know, our bodies are very efficient at taking and utilizing the nutrients that we do get. Mm-hmm. Is it ideal to always have a balanced plate whenever you can? I would say it's good to prioritize, but you're not just going to instantly fade away. If you happen to miss, you know, a meal that has protein or, You know, I think a lot of people often will say like, oh, I just had a bowl of pasta and that was the only thing I had. And it's like, well, technically, yeah, it's it's not even the worst thing that you could do because pasta in and of itself, it's not just carbohydrates. There is like some protein from the wheat, you know, that's used inside of that, you know, pasta. You are going to get a little bit of fiber. So it's not like everything is totally lost or that you ruined your diet, you know, in any specific way, Mm -hmm. a lot of it, you still have to kind of look from that nuanced perspective of like, Hey, there's still that big picture. That big picture is going to matter more than like all these like minuscule, like problems sometimes that we Mm -hmm. mentally create for ourselves because we didn't hit a specific target for something oof as a detail-oriented person it's it's, uh (laughs) tough for me not to get it's hard (laughs) it's it's not easy especially because we're inundated with this like Mm -hmm. need to be perfect for every single thing and you know you even see it with social Mm -hmm. media like every other video is like you shouldn't be eating that or you should be like getting this in every single day, like don't forget your greens powder or don't forget your protein powder. Mm -hmm. And it gets very overwhelming for people. And oftentimes like, you know, as a result, people end up just being like, well, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, let me just stop. You know, it's not worth doing this. Mm -hmm. And instead the focus should be trying to add what makes sense to someone like, you know, at any given time and do it at your pace. Because if you're trying to like match the fitness influencer that's doing like a hundred burpees or something like that every day and you've never done a burpee in your life. Like you're going to be disappointed when you can't do the same thing and you're going to count yourself as a failure versus someone that's like, Hey, I'm new to doing this. 
let me start off slow. So that way I'm not kind of burdening my body and then ending up like incapacitated for a full week because you overdid it. (laughs) No, literally. And like, let's be real, like half of these videos that you're seeing aren't even completely like these eat what I eat in a day's they're probably not completely accurate. Like I've, if I don't have time to make three meals in a day and I wanted to make it what I eat in a day video, I would combine like meals from different days if I had time. You know what I mean? So like it's, you just have to take it with a grain of salt because everything's one day a banana is good for you. The next day is bad for you. It's like you at this point, go back to the basics. You know that things that grow out of the ground are going to be nourishing for your body. The things that are ultra processed, probably not. And I think it can get really confusing because we know all of the basics and we know what's good for us and what's not, you know, being good for us being like the standard, I guess. But all the noise can crowd it so much. Yeah, no, I totally agree because like, I think that's the problem with a lot of nutrition advice that you see a lot of times is that, you know, a Mm -hmm. lot of people are, you know, focused on kind of like a quick fix or, you know, something that's going to be kind of like their get out of jail free card. Yeah. Oh, I get it. (laughs) That's just not how nutrition works. And, you know, that's kind of the other thing that stinks about nutrition is that you know the message isn't always sexy it's not always the most appealing thing to tell someone well you know it's just going to take time like no one wants to hear that it's going to take time it's Mm -hmm. going to take like some level of discipline to kind of get better with a lot of your habits you know it's very hard to unlearn a lot of the things that we're kind of taught as we're growing up because you know, we're hearing it even outside of like the internet, we're hearing it from family, we're hearing it from Mm -hmm. friends. Right. So there's a lot of things to try and relearn in a more positive light, you know, compared to what people Mm -hmm. are traditionally taught growing up, like, oh, you need to watch out, like, don't eat too many of those, because it essentially Mm -hmm. like builds that consistent feedback loop of just like that sense of like, oh, I'm doing something wrong, which is not necessarily the case. True. Even like carrots will mm-hmm. make your eyesight perfect. Yeah. I heard that all growing up. I'm like, is that even Yeah, true? I no, mean, I carrots are like one of my favorite <laughs> foods and I'm still wearing glasses. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Honestly, I should because every time I forget my contacts, it's like a little dangerous for yeah. me to walk We're relearning kind of all of this and you went on that journey to become a registered dietitian. You stopped eating meat. When did you start to feel the transition from seeing the kitchen as chaotic to a place where you actually started to enjoy cooking? Yeah, it took time. And I think I was very grateful at the time to give myself that grace because Mm -hmm. ultimately when I decided to go plant-based, my Dominican mother, and if you're not familiar with like Dominican cuisine, it's like very meat forward not not like everything is like loaded with meat but like a lot of the things that I grew up with like we had a lot of stewed meats and you know one of my favorite things growing up was like fried salami that we have and like you know those are things that I had like almost on repeat like on an every other day basis pretty much but surprisingly there was like a lot of stuff that was plant-based in learning that it just took time to kind of like learn how exactly to make those things but also you know even just like basics like how do I make oatmeal because like my mom would make me oatmeal like quite frequently but Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to make it like she would just have it prepared before I would go to school and you can learn it right you can yeah exactly (laughs) so it's like it took practice it took learning you know at least like you know how to hold a knife properly and like all these different skills But eventually you kind of like Mm. learn your way around the kitchen. And at least like for me, when it became peaceful was when pick up a knife to go cut some vegetables. I would like put on some music, listen to music, just like chop and kind of zone out because life at the time was like very stressful. And this was kind of like the only me time I had was like when I was in the kitchen because no one else would be there. It would just be me cooking my little plant-based meal Mm -hmm. and 
you know, it brought me a lot of comfort. And because of that, I found myself like coming back to the kitchen, like consistently, like it became my own little like protective cave, essentially to be in the kitchen. It also became a joy because, you know, as I was getting better with cooking, like I was able to share food with my siblings and my mom. And she eventually came around to like, understanding what I was trying to do, because pretty much what we ended up doing was looking at the stuff that she was making already and seeing what like plant-based twist we can make. Yeah. And a lot of it was like very simple too. It was like, oh, instead of using chicken bouillon, like use a vegetable bouillon cube instead. Or luckily as time went on too, like we started getting like better, you know, meat alternatives that were available at, at the store Or she would like sub some ground meat for like lentils. So there was like a lot of ways that we were able to kind of navigate that, but also kind of pull her into cooking again. Cause you know, she did admit like when I told her I was going plant-based, she thought it was like the biggest offense. She was like, how dare you like stop eating me? All this time I, you grew up with my food and now you hate it. Right. And she took it as a big offense. She thought I didn't like her food anymore. And, you know, it gave us, at least like as I was learning to cook, it gave us like more bonding time, which I think was probably like the thing that was most worthwhile about you know making the switch over is that I felt like I was able to learn more from my mom because of it you know I feel like it just made our bond a lot stronger than it used to be so there's a lot of things that I now associate positively with the kitchen versus like the chaos it used to be for me (laughs) (laughs) no that's amazing though that you were able to form a sort of collaboration with her and then learn from her and then have her learn from you too, because it really is a give and take kind of situation. But I approached the kitchen very similarly to you because it just, despite me wanting food to appear at times, it just is this sort of safe haven for me when I can put on a podcast or I can listen to music and it just is like me with no other noise. I'm not on my computer. I'm not working. I'm not talking to anyone. Like Something about cutting vegetables is just so soothing. And then when it's complete, it like gets eaten in five seconds and you have to do the dishes. Yeah. But <laughs> um, it can really just become this place where you just zone out and it's just like you enjoying yourself. And I think once you get to that point, it can be just like a really, really great thing. And it yeah, can become a hobby a, too. It's a good way to like learn different things. Like I think one of my favorite things to do, even during like the Um, pandemic, for example, it was like, there was all these online classes for food. It was like, oh, let me take like a dumpling making class. And like, let me learn something new. And I feel like sometimes if you infuse some of those like new and exciting things to learn about, like in the kitchen, it can also make the experience less daunting and like, unfun, because I feel like a lot of people, they might look at like a recipe that they have to make. And they're like, oh, I don't want to spend an hour in the kitchen doing this. And it's like, oh, well, why don't you instead spend an hour or even less, like making a meal that you actually want to eat. And then like, it won't be as stressful. (laughs) If anything, you'll be very excited once you actually get to the end point to eat it. I love that because I enjoy cooking now. I love the hard work aspect of it sometimes. Like if I'm making cinnamon rolls, I'm like, I know this is going to pay off. Like (laughs) for sure. (laughs) the uh, satisfaction at the end. But like you said, I do love sharing it with my siblings and my family and my friends. And aside from the ego boost it gives me, I just watching them enjoy something that I worked so hard on or something is just so like satisfying. And I don't really know how to describe it unless you experience it, but it could just be so gratifying a lot of the times. Now that um, we were talking about this. I would love to get more into your cookbook, Peaceful Kitchen, which came out earlier this month. And this is August, but this will probably come out in September, which yeah. it became a New York Times bestseller. Thank so you. congratulations. Yeah, I was huge. not expecting it. So it was a very lovely early birthday present. <laughs> <laughs> well, when's your birthday? It was August 25th. So it was like, I found out oh. just like a few days before and it was just like, a very fun weekend to celebrate. 
<laughs> no, that is fun. It's like double. Yeah. Well, happy um, late birthday and congratulations. That's Thank huge. You. So it's inspired by Mexican and uh, Dominican flavors, yeah. focused on plant-based meals. What has the response been like from others since it's come out? I mean, I'm assuming positive since it, it was doing so well on the list. Yeah, um, I think like the craziest part for it, and I feel like this shouldn't be new to me because like, even just before I put out the cookbook, like I have a blog and, you know, people would make recipes from my blog all the time. And they would share like on Instagram that they, you know, made something from there. And mm -hmm. I don't know why I didn't put two and two together in my brain. Like, oh, you know, you might get a similar response, you know, from people when your book comes out. And I felt like it was different in a way where it was like, wow, they cooked for my cookbook. It was like, that's just, for me, it's, it just felt very overwhelming, like how many people cook from it, but also just the, the continuous messages that I would get, you know, throughout the, you know, the time that the book has come out till now. I have gotten some like the sweetest messages. I've been able to connect Aww. with people. I think like, the thing sometimes that we don't realize with a lot of, you know, people that create content is that, you know, in some way you are impacting someone's life, hopefully for the better, right? <laughs> you know, hopefully a positive yes. uh, thing. <laughs> but, you know, the, the way that in which you can positively impact someone, it always just blows my mind because, you know, before I did content creation, I was working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, you know, just doing counseling. And I found that you know, job very gratifying, but the um, ability to kind of impact so many more people in like a short period of time, just it blows my mind every single day. Grateful that I'm able to impact someone's life to a point where someone will kind of message me and say like, oh my God, we just went plant-based or we started adding more plants to our plate and we're, you know, feeling better or like my blood markers are getting better. Or Aww. like I had someone say mm -hmm. that, you know, in a sense, because like, I don't usually share like calorie counts because I'm very yeah. mindful of like um, people with like eating disorders. And I've had a number of people say like, your food helped save my life because, you know, before I wasn't comfortable oh, wow. eating this food and, you know, your food gave me the courage to kind of like try and be more gentle with myself and like incorporate this food in. And so like, I feel very overwhelmed and like very privileged to be able to like impact anyone from that perspective. And I'm grateful too, because like it gives me the drive to like do more and like want to share more recipes because you know, I want to continue being able to help as many people as possible. Right. That's amazing. That's that's really incredible that you were able to to change people like that, even if it's just one yeah. person, you know. I think the difference, though, between videos and the cookbook is that videos sometimes can just be yeah. a one-off for people. They'll just see a recipe, they'll save it, and they'll make it. But the cookbook is like they're invested right. in you. And you worked so hard to create these incredible recipes over a long period of time, you know, and it, it means that they know you and they're more invested than you than maybe someone who just sees a video on yeah. reels, you know, I think that's definitely the reason. But I also am wondering, are there any recipes that didn't make the final cut of the book that you wanted to make? Yes, there is quite a number. And I'm hoping that I get an opportunity to do a second book because I would love to kind of show. I'm sure you will. <laughs> I, um... <laughs> On the best list, you're, you're there. Yeah, it's just a matter of time, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like there's a lot of because, like, cookbook process is like a long process. It's not like you know, yes. if I'm making a recipe this month, right? Like on my blog, it will show up next month or you know, next week, depending on like the timeline, right? Right? I've heard it's grueling, yeah, <laughs> it's like you have to sit with those recipes for like almost like two years, essentially, like you yeah. you come up with the concept, you, you know, develop it, you shoot it, and then you have to wait for all the editing process. And it takes a long time. So, you know, you're sitting with all that work. And in your head, you're like, Oh, but I have this idea. And I want to like, tweak this, like even more, because right. like, you're constantly learning things. And, you know, one recipe in particular, that I was like, bummed didn't work out the way that I wanted to like I tested it once and I was like oh this is so good like let me test it again and of course like 
when you're testing it again, it doesn't come out exactly the same as like the way that you photographed it the first time. And you're like, huh, there's, you know, like you don't want to put out a bad recipe in your cookbook, especially a debut cookbook. And there was like a cutlet, a tofu cutlet recipe that I had made that I really wanted to be in the cookbook. But that will have to wait for the next cookbook because I found a way to bread it without like the breading coming off. Because that was kind of like one of the issues that I find a lot with like some Uh, recipes. I I found a way to do it. I have an idea for a separate like recipe. And I'm just I'm excited to kind of get back to retrying and like retesting some new recipes for separate projects. Oh, that's so fun. Yeah, that I have that issue where I just... I never write down anything I do and then I literally can't replicate it and I get frustrated yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, that was so good. Like why did, cause I'll just throw things in and then I'll just miss that one thing that I couldn't remember that I did. And then it throws it all up. Yeah. Like, oh. I do that. I do that a lot sometimes where it's like in my head, I'm like, Oh, this isn't going to end up on the blog or the cookbook. I'm just going to like, ad lib Mm -hmm. it's not a big deal and then I'll make it I'm like oh wow this came out better than I thought it was gonna come out and I'm like oh man why didn't I write anything down or sometimes I wish I like could constantly like film it and just be like okay Mm -hmm. I did this and this and yeah I literally did that like recently I made one of like the best pastas I've ever made Mm -hmm. and then but before that I was like I just like don't feel like filming yeah and whatever. And now I can never replicate it again. So yeah, <laughs> it'll be forever told on this podcast that I've made the best pasta ever. <laughs> Maybe one day you'll figure it out. But it's it's <laughs> always so disheartening when like, that happens. Literally. What do you think is the most underrated recipe in the book? Ooh, um, that is a very good question. So I would say one of the underrated ones is this caramelized onion butter bean recipe that I have in my cookbook. Okay. So the idea for it came from a pasta dish that I shared um, (laughs) uh, like (laughs) a year before. And it, for whatever reason, went viral. I was like not expecting it to go um, do like to perform it's always well. the ones that you don't expect yeah yeah and um I was like ooh, I feel like this could also work really well with beans because like I wanted to kind of focus more on getting like beans on people's plate because they're very high in fiber and other nutrients and so I really focused on you know trying to kind of mimic those flavors but make it like bean form and I served it with like um like toasted bread and you know kind of gave some tips for how to you know, serve it other ways as well. Mm -hmm. And I just loved the flavors of it. And I remember I, I like froze the extras because I was like, oh, I'm going to enjoy this like a week after I finished like testing some of these other recipes. And then I went to go like reheat it. And my husband came in and he was like looking at it. He's like, what is this? And I was like, oh, this is like the caramelized butter beans. And he was like, oh, it's just butter beans. So I was like, no, I was like, but they're really good. And then I, he doesn't get it. Yeah. So then he like tried it and he was like, oh my God, like these are so good. I was like, I know. It's like, they don't, they look so unexpected, you know? And yeah. I was just, I don't know. That's just one that always like sticks out because it also just utilizes like very simple ingredients that you likely have on hand. It doesn't have to take a long time to prepare and it's just, it's very simple, but like the payoff for it is like so good in terms of flavor. Mm -hmm. I think honestly, when people hear beans, they're like, nah. Yeah. They're like, oh, whatever. But I'm like, oh man, that's like the wrong thing to tell like a Dominican woman. Like we we have just like, we live off beans, but like, they're like really good beans. Like I feel like people just don't get it. People don't get it. That and rice. Yeah. yeah for, you, absolutely. Absolutely. People underestimate the flavor of rice. I literally am obsessed with basmati rice. I make it like Ugh. every day at this point. They sent me, because um, since I write about a lot of stuff, they sent me a ton of rice and it was this huge box. It was probably 12 packets of rice. I was like, I'm never going to use all of this. I'm literally <laughs> on my last package. <laughs> oh man, that's like being rice. Like I feel like everyone else could like live off of like a lot of variety in terms of the grains. And I'm just like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel if I only had 
rice as an option, I would be totally fine. <laughs> Yep. I don't even need that much. I mean, this yeah. is just me being uh, Italian American and Irish, yeah. but <laughs> I could yeah. I just need butter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally understand that. <laughs> I'm curious too, do you think that the young girl version of yourself who loves sugar would have predicted where you're at now? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I always kind of laugh at that because yeah, I was very addicted to sugar. I use that term very loosely too. Like I, I think some people like there's not really like a true, true addiction. It's more yeah, of like right. it's very hyper palatable. It's like very enjoyable. Like who doesn't love love something sweet? sweet? Yeah. Um especially when it's like the right balance. But yeah, I feel like now my palate has definitely shifted a lot, especially in learning about food. Mm-hmm. Uh, I still love desserts. I think desserts are still like my favorite thing. But Mm -hmm. if I had to compare the amount of sugar in my desserts versus like what maybe like my past self would have enjoyed, Mm -hmm. I feel like it's so different. Like there's even desserts now that I'll try and I'm like, oh, this is like too sweet. And I don't think I would have ever said that when I was younger. A lot of it has to do with balance. It's like, you know, I feel like sweet things are good, but if it's not balanced the right way, like it can still Mm -hmm. taste bad. So yeah. Yeah. I think so too. It's just age. It's it's like when you get older, you start to like red wine versus white because it's just like it's more dry and less sweet kind mm-hmm. of deal. But I kind of have a similar thing where I mean, I love desserts, but I also was a crazy picky eater. Like mm. I would only eat certain vegetables. I didn't even want them to touch. Like I was so crazy. And now I'm a food journalist who eats like the craziest things on the planet. Um, so if I told myself when I was younger that I would be doing this, I would have been utterly shocked. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like a lot of things kind of come full circle when you don't, Mm -hmm. when you least expect it. I find that a lot of times I thought like growing up, it's like, oh, I'm not that picky because like I knew picky people. But then Mm -hmm. when I think about all the things I became like exposed to food wise after becoming vegan, like my mind would have been blown because like I tried so many different fruits I never tried before. I tried so many more vegetables than, you know, the standard broccoli, carrots and cauliflower that like sometimes I get fed for dinner. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, I tried different cuisines, you know, because especially um, if you look at a lot of populations around the world and not looking at like major cities, but even just like people in less fortunate towns, like they often go for, bean-based dishes or, you know, what people often call peasant food, but it's kind of, sometimes it's like the tastiest food. So you get exposed to like a lot of different, you know, diversity. And, you know, if you keep an open mind, you can kind of explore some of like the most delicious food that you probably would have never gotten the experience to try. Right, right. I think that's, we were talking about rice earlier. I feel like rice is so like, what is the word? I don't know. I blanked on the word, but it's kind of, oh, classified. That's what I was saying. Mm-hmm. It's, it's classified as, you know, a peasant food too. And mm-hmm. I really, because it, it was just naturally cheaper as yes. you know, an option, which, you know, makes sense, but it's also the, one of the most versatile foods mm-hmm. that you can eat. So it's just like crazy how much us growing up in different areas affects everything. Me being in LA now, I'm lucky enough to try so many different foods and lucky enough to be able to pay to like go out to eat at certain times obviously still on budget i'm in la but (laughs) my latest thing has been like peruvian food which is not Mm. something i would ever get i'm from connecticut so like it's not something i'd really get in my suburb town of connecticut you know (laughs) exactly you know outside of dominican food i was sharing like mexican food and you know there's like thai dishes and you know japanese dishes that i absolutely Mm -hmm. adore that have absolutely had very positive you know influence in my cooking journey Mm -hmm. and you know those were kind of like sprinkled throughout the cookbook because i feel like as simple as some of those recipes might seem like they have so many different flavor profiles and so much variance that I feel like it just kind of makes cooking more enjoyable when we can kind of like learn from each other with what you said about rice like everyone enjoys rice differently and it's almost like with every dish it's you know if you look at like chicken dishes around the world like 
everyone has their variation of it. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many ways to, you know, enjoy foods in different cultures. I think it's very exciting to be able to also do that from like a plant-based perspective, because mm-hmm. a lot of people would just assume, and, you know, I've gotten this like a lot. It's like, oh, you just eat salads all day. And it's like, no, I do um, not. Like, yeah, I'd be pretty salad. miserable if that was the case. And I like salads, but like, you know, not I that like, much. yeah, I like to cook a lot of cooked food a lot more. So yes, no, I totally get that. I'm wondering too, if you could give advice and this is to help others as well, but give advice to the younger version of yourself regarding nutrition and eating habits, what would it be? I would say go at your own pace. I think that's something that I feel like a lot of you know, not just like myself, but like a lot of young people should hear because I feel like there's a lot of gimmicks out there in terms of like what health actually looks like. And a lot of it tells you to go from like zero to, you know, 60 and, you know, like instantaneously, like you have to take out all the flavor of your food, like no more sugar, no more this and that, no more salt. And it's like, okay, you know, we can see maybe this vision of what we think makes us feel our healthiest. And we don't have to, you know, jump into that cold turkey, like we can take one step at a time, maybe it's add this specific food or try this and, you know, be more open minded to trying things. And being okay with, you know, failing at things too, because, you know, with experimenting and figuring out the best way to live your life, it is really, really, really helpful to not be so frigid. Like a lot of diet gurus will kind of tell you to be. It's like, hey, not every single day is going to be a perfect day and that's okay. But a lot of times, like when it comes to, you know, figuring out what your food philosophy is going to be, it's going to be experimentation. It's going to be, you know, having good days and bad days and not necessarily letting the, the bad days kind of ruin your life and make you feel like, you know, you shouldn't have even tried to begin with because you might end up finding that one, you love different cuisine or you love to chop vegetables in the kitchen and find peace there. You might mm-hmm. feel like, you know, you want to start, you know, a whole cookie channel. Like there's a lot of things to keep your mind open to. And a lot of that, you know, you don't get there instantaneously. It's all stuff that you kind of slowly start adding and building into your day. Mm-hmm. And one of the terms I can't stand that gets thrown around so often is cheat day. Yeah. Can't, can't stand, stand that. Stand it. No. I think it's so mentally bad to think that way at least for my personal experience but I just like to cheat on your diet means you're restricting yourself to the point where now you feel bad if you have like a piece of pasta you know yeah it's just so absurd to me I can't stand that when that gets thrown around yeah it's it's not helpful to kind of like demonize something to that extent especially because I feel like we would all benefit more if we realize that we can coexist with different foods. And, you know, if we have a healthy mindset around a lot of these foods, like they can still be part of, you know, how we're eating, you know, we better understand, like, how does it actually fit into our day? Because I think that's sometimes why we end up deciding to kind of like binge out on certain foods. It's not because we don't know that they're bad like, or that, you know, they're good or whatever. A lot of it is because we have these preconceived notions in our head about certain foods. And, you know, when we start to villainize something, it's easy to kind of treat that as like a temptation food, like, ooh, like, I want that whole chocolate cake. And, you know, you could instead have a different mindset of it, like, okay, you know, I'll have this slice of cake, but I'll focus on making sure that I'm enjoying it and not just like eating it Mm -hmm. in front of the TV where I'm just going to be distracted and finish that cake and be like, ooh, I need another piece of cake. It's like 
that whole practice of being present, being able to enjoy a moment, being able to enjoy food peacefully. So that way you can build better relationships with your food. And a lot of times like that takes care of what you need in that day. And then you don't have to worry about giving anything up that you would actually enjoy. That's so interesting. I guess I never really thought it about it that way to the point where cheat days actually made it more appetizing. Mm -hmm. We're having those pancakes or whatever, actually like it, it makes it feel almost like a guilty pleasure, which is another term I can't stand. Yeah. You know, like there shouldn't be guilt with food. Like there's nothing to be guilty about with food. You need to eat to live. Right. (laughs) Food is food. And I think like you can also think of it from the other perspective too, right? Like, you know, I think if you ask people, like, do you think kale is healthy? Everyone would probably be like, yeah, kale is healthy. It's like dark leafy greens. Everyone tells you that you need to be eating your vegetables. But, you know, you can take it to the same extreme as we take, you know, some of our sweet desserts. And if the only thing that you're eating is like a whole bag of kale every day, like, yes, kale is technically healthy, but like, is that also healthy? It really isn't because you're missing out on other nutrients that you could be getting from other foods. So, you know, that's kind of like the danger of demonizing foods, because again, like you start, you know, makes it extreme. Yeah, you start restricting things to the point where like, oh, then you're very limited to the certain foods that you can eat. And then it's like, is that really a healthy mindset? Or is that like very restrictive eating? And is that turning more to like eating disorder mindset? And, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. that's where it's like, it's so much better to focus on balance and focusing on the foods that you know, you should be kind of consuming most of the time and still finding places to kind of allow some of those treats in because it just makes it so much easier not to hyper fixate on things because again that can lead to you know dangerous ex- extremes on either end which we don't want and that's why you created a balanced cookbook yeah <laughs> you all yeah <laughs> little promo yes everything can feel indulgent right <laughs> All right. So let's talk about what's next for you. We kind of, I mean, you just came out with a cookbook, but I always ask the question, do you have any upcoming projects you would like to share anything else going on? Hopefully down the line, a second cookbook will be there, but right now bask in the glory of your first one. Yes. I think um, since the book just came out very recently, uh, Mm -hmm. still kind of enjoying the wave of it right now and getting back into more of my consistent routine. So no current projects as of yet, but I am brainstorming for like that follow-up cookbook. So we'll see what happens. (laughs) Exclusive. I have a short game for you if you're up for it to kind of wrap everything up. So it's like a little lightning round. I name some foods or food trends and you're going to tell me if it's a smash or pass, for or against kind of okay. deal. Does that make mm-hmm. sense? Okay. Drum roll quick. First one, canned vegetables. Ooh, smash. I think they can be very helpful, especially from like a convenience perspective. I always recommend either trying to do things that are like no salt, no sugar added when possible, but very easy way to get some extra veggies, beans, all that great stuff for you. Okay. All right. Second one nutritional yeast oh that is a smash i use that quite frequently i'm not like super obsessed with it like some people are but i feel like it does give like good umami flavor okay what do you use it in do i use it in a soup once Mm -hmm. and then someone told me to sprinkle it on popcorn yeah like i think that's probably the most popular one i hear like people sprinkle it on popcorn it kind of has like a little bit of a cheesiness to it in flavor like it's not cheese like i tell people like it's yeah. like cheesy essence if that I think that's like the best way to describe it but I find that it also adds a lot of umami flavor so sometimes like if I'm doing like breadcrumbs for like like I was talking about that tofu oh, cutlet like I like adding yeah. it to it and I feel like it helps add some extra richness to the flavor of the breading which I think is helpful Oh, then no, that's so smart. I'm going to do that because yes. I normally do add cheese. So maybe I'll just do both. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's great too because like the, it gives you some extra B vitamins. A lot of them tend to be fortified with B12. So it's just like extra mm-hmm. nutrition, you know? 
Mm -hmm. And B12 is something I am lacking that I know for sure. (laughs) Well, then definitely start adding. (laughs) (laughs) Now everyone knows that. All right. Third one, mushroom steaks. I'm going to pass on that. And the main reason is because typically whenever I think of mushroom steaks, I think about going to restaurants and that being like the only offering for vegan. And it's like, I love mushrooms, but if someone's serving me a mushroom steak, I'm going to be very disappointed because I know like I'm going to finish that meal. I will have paid like the same absurd entree price Mm -hmm. for it. And I'm going to be hungry like 30 minutes later. So (laughs) (laughs) That's the same when you go to a pizza place and they have like the one gluten free crust that's like awful. And then it's just disappointing. Yeah. It's like, why even offer that? Like, I'd rather just not eat anything. Or I just would have gotten like a cauliflower crust from Trader Joe's and made it. Yeah. (laughs) Like save me, save me the time and money, please. (laughs) Yeah, no, exactly. Fourth one, I actually just read an article about this. So if you need me to explain it, but I feel like it's self-explanatory. Scrambled pancakes. Oh, um, I personally haven't tried it. So I would probably say pass. I feel like I'm only passing because I haven't tried it and I don't want to like get my hopes up, but I feel like I've seen it before. I feel like it's good for people if you don't feel confident flipping your pancakes. <laughs> no, that's so yeah. <laughs> I, I did it myself and my favorite part of the pancake is the outer crust. Oh, yes. I agree. Like when it's a little slightly crunchy. And this is basically just a bunch of the middle. Ah. That's what it is. So when you scramble it, it's not there. You don't get that crunch. It's just like, so if you love the fluffy part of the pancake that's in the middle, then that would probably be for you. But uh, okay, it's not going to be my first yeah. choice because I like, I like crunch. Uh, I love like the crusty edges. Like that's like my favorite part of the pancake. <laughs> So I am glad I passed that one. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There you go. Because and the butter too. It's just like it's like it's it's a whole experience to eat the whole thing. And I feel like everyone has like their specific way of eating their pancake too. Like that's so true. So yeah, no, I have to have it whole so I can have it like my way. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. I actually I was with out with my friends last weekend and or a few weekends ago. And we'll go out for pancakes sometimes like late at night. It, this was like 2 a.m. We were getting pancakes. And one of my friends was like, stop, like don't eat your pancakes because I have a specific way that I'm going to make these pancakes perfect. And she like had this whole method of like get it, putting the butter in each layer and then oh, like wow. putting the maple syrup. I was like, honestly, though, this is a process, but it's incredible. And I'm for it. <laughs> that is <laughs> like but. Yeah, no, that is that is definitely like taking it and elevating it beyond like measure. Right Next level. Next level chefing it right. at 2 a.m. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> All right. The fifth one, I don't know if you've seen this yet, but the cucumber salad thing oh, in the container. Yes. Okay. So anytime that this a trend will help someone eat more vegetables. I don't care how silly it sounds. That will always be Mm -hmm. a smash because, you know, I feel like we need to be kind of inventive. I know it's like based off of, you know, other ethnic dishes. Sometimes you have to kind of like introduce something in a different way for someone to get it. You know what I mean? And, you know, especially for people that struggle with getting vegetables, it's, a fun it's a convenient way to kind of get them in and even if you don't eat technically like the the whole cucumber like you could at least have it in your storage container and you can close it up put it back in the fridge you don't have to worry about it like going bad instantly so I feel like it's very clever and yeah I'm definitely for it me too me too so I I saw some of the comments be like oh these people are hydrated as all heck. Yeah. Because they're just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard that. Um, I think there was like some news article I said where like, I think it was Iceland. Yeah, I think like they like ran out of cucumbers or something like that. It just. <laughs> I was like, no way. <laughs> I was just like, wow, like, I guess the trend is really working. Like, people are really hydrating themselves off this cucumber. 
Wait, that's so funny. Yeah. Not at Reaching Graceland. Yeah. I've actually been obsessed with Trader Joe's sells these like little mini cucumbers. Mm, yep. That are like so small. And I love those. I've been eating them like so much actually. And I feel like it's a well kept veggie secret because I just, I don't eat them in things. I literally just eat it as a snack. Yeah. I feel like any type of mini vegetable, for whatever reason, I feel like they're easier for our brains to accept versus like <laughs> the regular size vegetables. I feel this way a lot with like baby carrots. Like I love carrots, yeah, but I'll true. eat like, a whole bag of baby carrots a lot easier than like if someone gives me an actual carrot and I have to peel it and like cut it up I'm like "Uh, I'll go with the baby carrot because it's like easier (laughs) yeah why does food taste better when it's miniature I don't really understand that yeah it's like cherry (laughs) tomatoes it's like they're all like perfect it's like yeah that doesn't make any sense but like it's it's like mini M and M's which you know I know we're nutrition and all but yeah (laughs) they, they Tastes so much better than the regular. It's like concentrated, yeah. like flavor in small package size, right? Yeah, it's probably just concentrated shots of sugar <laughs> versus like it being a little more spicy. Yeah. <laughs> but whatever, yeah. whatever. <laughs> All right, my final question for you that I ask every single guest is: is if there is one cooking utensil or appliance you think everyone should splurge on, what would it be and why? Ooh, splurge on. Mm-hmm. That is a great question. It's um, the key word that always stumps people. <laughs> yeah. See, like, I know, like, if I had to pick, a, like, any kitchen tool, I know which one. Um, For one that way, I would splurge on, maybe I would say, maybe I would say, like, a food processor. Because... Mm, that's a good one. And I say this because, like, can you get away with, like, a st- like a regular, like, rinky-dink food processor? processor? Yes, you can. But if you get a really good food processor, you don't have to scrape down the sides as much, which I find is, like, very annoying for wow. me. <laughs> That's a game changer. <laughs> and I don't know. I feel like they can be really worthwhile. I would say a close second would be a really good immersion blender, but like one that's Mm -hmm. like cordless. And before I had one that had a cord and it was like really cheap, it did the job. Like I had no issues with it, but like if you've ever had to plug one in and like blend up a soup or something like that in a pot, I feel like it's it's very annoying because the cord gets everywhere. Um, so yeah. I invested a little bit more into a cordless immersion blender and I feel like it was a major game changer. I would say those okay. two. <laughs> okay. I've said on the, when, literally when I started this podcast, I said I needed an immersion blender. Still don't have yeah. one. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's, just, I, that's just pure laziness. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I totally get it. If I'm very much a big encourager of like, everyone knows the tools that they need to succeed in the kitchen. And mm-hmm. you know, I feel like not a lot of people need a lot of very high end things, you know, in the kitchen to That's succeed. Honestly, if you have a cutting board and a good knife, that's really all you need. Everything else is just extra, you know, if you need it, you know, you're better saving your money to get like good quality fruits and vegetables instead of like spending $500 on a really expensive blender and you only use it like occasionally in the kitchen yeah. all right I like that spin I'm setting myself up for success and I know what I need mm-hmm. versus me just being lazy and not getting yeah it. <laughs> then you won't have a lot of clutter in your kitchen which I think no one really wants which I <laughs> yes I know it's getting there trust yeah. me <laughs> I, you're you're talking to someone whose kitchen is constantly cluttered so <laughs> yeah. my whole life is yeah. cluttered and then I bring it everywhere else <laughs> same it just keeps it keeps spanning. Then I'll go visit home and I'll just do it there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so, so much. This was a super fun conversation. It was so amazing to meet you. Congratulations on your cookbook you. and all of your success. I'm excited to see where you go from here. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk. And yeah, hopefully, you know, we could do this again, maybe for the next cookbook. <laughs> oh, yeah. For sure. You are welcome anytime to talk. Cucumbers, <laughs> nutritional <yeast>. scrambled pancakes, <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever floats your boat. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So 
You can keep up with Catherine on Instagram at plantbasedrd, or you could snag her cookbook on Amazon. I'll add it to my storefront. I have a section for podcast guests. So if you look there, it's named Peaceful Kitchen, more than 100 cozy plant-based recipes to comfort the body and nourish the soul, which is out now. Hey, fellow foodies. Thanks so much for listening. And don't forget to leave me a review. While you're at it, make sure to follow me at Livin' for Food Pod on Instagram or TikTok or email me at livinforfoodpod at gmail.com. Let me know what you're cooking up this week, which guests you would like to see on the podcast, or tell me your opinions on the latest viral food trend. And in case you're just joining me, there is an entirety of season one ready and waiting for you. Until next time.